friends, and uh, I'm Rick, and this is your seat at the table, and we are talking all things Battletech, and a little Starfighter here, one of a few dozen that I have left. Uh, this is jump ships, drop ships, and jump ships from Battletech. This would be the initial primer on uh, star travel and uh, space travel in the inner sphere for Battletech uh, 3025, and later this is, let's see, this book cost me $15. And I bought this in 1988. And so we have introduction, a document has been divided into five chapters, describe the history, develop modern space travel from the era of the early pioneers, recent centuries of successors wars, scientific developments, events that occur prior to the formation of Star League has been given special emphasis. The <coughs> second chapter describes the modern jump ship and its role in the inner sphere, including descriptions of five major types of jump ships currently operating in the inner sphere. third chapter describes 20 of the best known drop ship types are still in operation, most are still produced on a limited basis. And they're uh, grouped in category. Fourth chapter discusses the role of small craft, whose dead ons number of small craft to operate. And the fifth final chapter uh, outlines the control, uh, role of space stations during the era of succession wars. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> A little bit going down the wrong, uh, a little tickle there in the front. So, for basic history and stuff, which you know, there's a lot of in places, there's a lot of stuff out there on the net that goes into this. Uh, the Sarnet's net's got quite a bit of it. I'm not gonna, that's not what we're here. That's not what we're here for. No, sir. We're here just a glance at the book. We got our jump ships. The jump ships provide the only means of transportation between star systems in the inner sphere and the periphery, able to make interstellar leaps of up to 30 light years at a time. Jump ships are practically unlimited range because they are powered by a solar energy sail, etc., etc., etc. Scout class, merchant class, Vader class, Star Lord class, Monolith class, and then various drop ships. Jump ships are the rarest and therefore the most critical link of space travel. These vessels would be next to the useless without drop ships. Often referred as the workhorse in the inner sphere, drop ships range from under 2,000 tons to 100,000 tons of mass, two basic types uh, spheroid and uh, aerodynamic. The, uh, it's interesting though that, that they leave room, so they're, the, these are not all the possible jump ships and drop ships available. These are the most commonly found. And that implies that there are still others. And uh, starships or warships, etc., et come with their own source book. That's a different book. And at the time of 3025, outside the clans, which didn't nobody knew about at this point, no surviving warships are available to anywhere in the inner sphere for the periphery. Right? It's just they're just not there. So we're looking at various types of drum ships or drop ships in this case. Obviously there's far more of these than there are others of uh, the jump ships. In here, in the lore, in here, it implies that there are roughly 2,000 remaining jump ships available to the inner sphere. Now you make the argument, uh, is that just specifically to the inner sphere? If so, then that doesn't account for the jump ships that are in the in the periphery and or in the possession of Comstar and other entities other than the houses themselves. Uh, if you take it verbatim, then that says that this is all there are, period. So when I did earlier in one of my other videos, I kind of did a breakdown of it and somewhere in here in my pile of notes, I still have that that information and the gist yeah, here we go uh, the gist of that would be is I made the argument that if 2,000 jump 2,000 quote jump ships are all that's available to the inner sphere then uh, are available period then it would go to say that percentage that must belong to the periphery and the pirates and things like this so I said okay 10% we'll say roughly 200 of those 2,000 available jump ships are in the possession of the periphery houses and independent uh, traders and uh, that operate outside the inner sphere and uh, pirate groups because obviously none of those entities can exist if they don't have the means to get around. It just it just doesn't work without jump ships. Period. So that would so that gives us roughly about 1,800. And it says in the lore here it estimates that 70 17 percent of that quote 2,000 are in the possession of mercs and. 40% of that 2,000 are in the possession of merchants. So if I take out 
That means there's roughly 306 jump ships owned and operated by mercenary outfits, 720 jump ships operated by merchants, and 774 operated by the various houses. Now, I would agree with that if that was the average for individual houses. Let's say House Devon and House Davion, House Corita, and House Steiner all have roughly 1,800 jump ships available between the merc units and, and, and the merchants and the house direct house military control, uh, that would be much more viable in my palette than the other way around. So when you break it all down based on the number that they gave in this book, that and you minus 10% for the periphery, then it apparently, approximately there's 144 merchant ships per house, and approximately each house fleet consists of about 148 jump ships. And of course that's going to go up and down. House Leal would have much fewer, House Davion, House Steiner probably has maybe more, etc, etc. And then you can break it down even further by category. Uh, most and many of the monoliths are the largest jump ships available, and the scouts are the smallest jump ships available are in the possession of House Corita, uh, but they're rare. They're rare, so there's not very many of them, but they have the much greater capacity for hauling things, etc., etc. So when we get into small craft, and you're basically shuttles and pods, things that get you around in space. Let's take that for account. It also suggests in here, in the lore, that there are about 25,000 dropships total, give or take, spread around the inner sphere. 25,000. That would suggest, if you break them evenly, that there's approximately 5,000 jump sh drop ships per house. Now, that number seems to be a little low, too, in my mind. And I'll get to that, because there are some elements of stuff that the lore doesn't care about, or didn't address, because they didn't think they needed to, or they chose not to. And I'll give you, I want to give you a point. See, it says, when we talk about the 20 that they show, but here's the dropship design. There are approximately 100 different dropship designs throughout the inner sphere. Designs range from small military assault ships to gargantuan civilian cargo vessels, and from small passenger liners to troop transports. Although these designs vary, they can be grouped into two constructions. So basically, they're, they're leaving 80% of dropship design to the player to come up with. You, you can have all kinds of drop, uh, dropship designs. You can have different jump ship designs. It's just you're, you're supposed to be within a certain set, or, set of parameters. So they have some limits on, on when you manufacture these things. You can't have a million ton dropship because it won't work. And, and the game mechanics will not quote, will not allow for it. And if you kit bash that, if you choose to go with house rules, then you're altering the basic fundamental base, uh, concept of mechanics for the game, and that's on you, and it's specifically for your campaign and your, and your world. And you're entitled to do that. You're absolutely entire, entitled to do that. But the game mechanics have their limits for good reasons. It's the same reason in that same venue. It's of my opinion that one of the reasons that the how, that uh, the game lore initially said set a very strict limit to how many jump ships are available to the to the, the interstellar period is to mitigate and limit the idea of total warfare. The I, this idea that that. Uh, they want, it's much more conducive for our tabletop wargaming uh, uh, and our mech, and our, our role-playing game systems to allow uh, there to be a very big constraint. Uh, it's much more fun for small units to go on raids and to defend against raids and to interact as elements within something bigger than to have a, a yet all-out uh, concept. It's not until later in the game con concepts that the idea of a new a new for, uh, succession war breaks out, where literally hundreds and hundreds of combat uh, mech regiments and supporting units, thousands of supporting units, are moved around the inner sphere in vast numbers in in a hurry. And uh, that's it was because it was from that timeline that made me go, wait a minute, that it's just not. Why is it that there's this artificial limit, and why? Why is that not set right in my mind? And I believe that it's grossly short of what there ought to be. And the, the house lore addresses this a little bit, but no, at no point since. Fan Pro, Catalyst, 
Uncle Bucks, uh, Uncle Tex from whatever, and nobody used to come up with me uh, to me and said, look, uh, maybe those early numbers were a little jaded or a little under under evaluated and or this is why we were sticking to that. My personal belief is, like I said, is they chose to limit. We didn't want another Star Trek and Star Wars. They didn't want space travel to be as common as jumping in the sh jumping in your car and running to the grocery store. They wanted it to be a crucial Achilles heel to prevent any major massive changes to the inner sphere. And to do this is to, from a military perspective is to limit how much capability of moving things around there are. But in doing so, they can't really, they don't care. It wasn't important enough to the game designers to warrant an, uh, uh, an explanation as to how then do they support the economy and people. How does the people, how do you have this inter, truly interstellar community where people can get on the passenger shuttle, uh, passenger, passenger drop ships and, and get on to uh, jump ships and then travel from worlds to worlds for just for pure leisure or for for business and so on and just for movement uh, for I'm moving from one house to another because of my job that kind of thing uh, and then they sure most certainly did not take into account the sheer amount of tonnage required to support interstellar entities over and over and over again in lore in the books in the novels in everything it's implied there are world after world that are dependent on other worlds for food for water for resources for defense for communication for everything yet they do not have the capacity to have that depend that dependence if, if we took it to take a look at the 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 Laren Commonwealth, the, the richest, most industrial capable uh, of the great houses. The sheer magnitude of their economy dictates that there has to be a huge number of jump ships to move all that commerce and resources around. Period. Right. So that's just, yeah, yeah, I'm ranting. Yeah, tough. All right, so jump ship design, there are approximately two dozen varieties of jump ships still operating. So they only give you like five or six of them as examples, so there's still plenty of room to maneuver, but they're all going to be within certain, within the parameters of what the design mechanics allow for. All jump ships are similar construction, share many major design components. Some older versions designed for independent use are not, and not for carrying drop ships are extremely rare. It is believed that there are fewer than a half dozen of these ships remaining. Most jump ships resemble arrows and goes on, talks about the drive systems and, this, and, and fuel, cargo sections, van sections, literally the entire workings of how things work, right? We've got ship operations and some basic rules for how to deal with that, space operations, you know, travel date, time dates based on the planetary, like based on the, the stars, the stars uh, category, planetary operations, vector thrust, Special operations, ship operations, right? Jump points, recharge operations, maneuvering operations, docking operations, decompression, boarding, repelling, abandoning ship, routine operations, purchasing a space vessel, ship cost. This is another thing that just First, they tell you that there's this there's this serious limit to how many jump ships there are. They're literally in the hundreds. Each house has hundreds of drop ship or jump ships available, and between all the great houses, and none of the periphery states have the ability to manufacture jump ships. And Comstar is not brought into the equation, and the clans haven't haven't arrived yet. So, amongst the five great houses, only the the total of Production averages 12 jump ships per year. That's not enough. That's not enough to support, you know, the 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 attrition rate of accidents that are going to occur in 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 uh, uh, failure rates. So some what that tells you is as many of the existing jump ships that are available now are hundreds. They're centuries old. Some of them 
go back to the Star Age, uh, the Star League era, and then po possibly some of these rare, fewer design ships, the ones that there may be only six or seven left in the entire known space, may predate the Star League to the earliest days of, of star travel. So the possibility that some of these ships have some serious longevity and their ability to just keep man keeping in mind that all the technology uh, crunch and uh, stuff that's occurred uh, in the, the first to three succession wars, especially after the first succession war is such a devastating impact on everybody. I mean, literally, just literally, you know, obliterating everybody into the Stone Age, then we're talking, uh, you know, it's just... Geez, come on! What? There, the, the, there's no way. There's just no way that this is sustainable, in my opinion. And I just lost track of my my rant. So, and that happens sometimes when I do that. And that's it is what it is. So, to purchase a new dropship or jump ship was a major undertaking. A new Leopard class dropship costs about sixty million sea bills. So, average vehicles can be purchased for less than half that. So I, I'm more than inclined to believe that if you're starting a Merc unit or you or whatever, and you you, you want to purchase a drop ship, that's viable. That's considering the quote twenty five thousand roughly available according to the lore that's in this book or quote canon that's in this book. Then yes, that's a doable thing. But there's less than two thousand jump ships available collectively to all the houses in the inner sphere. Uh, acquiring even a beat up one is going to be almost should be impossible. A Merc unit in by rights should not be able to acquire them unless they were earned or stolen or given to them by a house. The truth is how they retain them and keep them maintenance because the only sh maintenance shipyards available would be available to the great houses and not to the general population in general. And uh, so the mercenary commands would have to be at the whim and folly of the, the great houses. This also has the issues with how does the periphery function? How does the periphery function if there's no active shipyards in the periphery that, that, that can manufacture, let alone repair the existing ships that are out there in the periphery? How does a how does a pirate ship captain how does a pirate captain maintain his jump his jump ship? How does he get parts? Can he get parts? Because if he goes out scavenging other jump ships for stuff, every house, by, by the canon mindset, every house should go hunt him down. Because this is sancto sanctus. This is one of those technologies that you absolutely forbidden to screw with. Because it's so rare. And it's so hard to fix and replace. And without jump ships, the inner sure doesn't exist. Straight. It is what it is. I don't think they emphasize it enough. They do a credible job of emphasizing just how critical that Achilles heel is, but still, there's still some questions here. So you got to find a lease, ship availability. You know, new vessels are not necessarily vessels that are straight off the assembly line. In fact, very few vessels can be found in mint condition. So a new vessel is one that has been well maintained and refurbished. Vessels in this condition are reliable and have minimal maintenance costs. A less expensive alternate is a salvage vessel. The main problem with salvage vessels is they have much greater likelihood of system breakdown. Destroyed ships or vehicles no longer function. The reason for purchasing a destroyed vessel is a ship can be obtained for a greatly reduced price and can be fixed up to salvage or even new quantity or quality. As long as the destroyed vessel retains its destroyed status, however, it does not require monthly maintenance. You know, so determine if a particular vessel is available. And here's our charts for students. So the uh, ship availability, vessel locations, repairs, estimating repair costs. Conducting repairs, component replacement, ship maintenance, ship costs and servicing, drop ship revenues, making a living, jump ship revenues. See, they had to, they wanted to include the ability to do that. So I mean, this put a grossly grossly stated limit to how many vehicles and ships that can be available and yet have all the rules and stuff for you to be one of those extremely rare individuals that have the means and the ability to pursue those things, right? So, I should have wrote that down, or I should have put down the chapter where that was at. And I come back to the history. Yeah, right here, the modern age. And I'll read that. 
With the fall of the Star League in 2781, the start of the almost 250 years of almost continual combat known as the Secession Wars, science and technology have progressed. As wars ravaged the achievements of man thus far, much of mankind's hard-won scientific and technological knowledge began to be lost. Industries and other strategic military targets were destroyed as each of the five leaders of Secession States struggled for dominance. At the present time, the Secession States possess a minute fraction of the original FTL ship construction. Keep in mind that phrase, a minute faction, fraction of the original construction at the height of the Star League. Estimate, estimates indicate only about a dozen new jump ships are produced each year among all the successor houses. This low-level production can barely keep up with the annual number of jump ships lost to war and age-related breakdowns. The remaining vessels number about 2,000, give or take, but 2,000, an amount that has remained fairly constant for decades. Dropship production has also suffered greatly from the average's war, whereas at one time thousands of dropships were produced annually. Now only about 30 or 45 come out out of the few remaining construction facilities. Even so, the number of dropships still operating in a sphere has held fairly steady, with esti still estimated about 25,000 vessels of both civilian and military types. While this may seem like a large number, the figure does not reflect the operational status of these vessels, and many are old and have parts that are no longer serviceable. Then we have a list of manufacturers, types that they manufacture, and where they're located. So, break. All right, I'll bring on my notes, because that's what we do. And, uh, let me pop this up here, so, right? All right. So, FTL travel in the inner sphere. Lore stipulates that the current, as of 3025, production of jump ships is, is a minute production of, at the height of the starlight. What do they mean by a minute? What do they mean by a fraction? Lore states, as of 3025, the combined jump ship production of all houses is approximately 12 per year. Discounting Comstar and Clan production, this implies that at the height of the Star League, estimated production would have been around in the hundreds. And I say, if we, if we take the phrase literally, a minute of production would suggest, i.e. 60 minutes out of an hour, that it, at its height, the Star League produced about 720 jump ships per year. This number makes sense to me. This is a viable number. This number really works for me, as opposed to 12. An estimated 720 per year for 320 years leaves us with approximately 230,000. 230,000, give or, give or take, Number of jump ships that were produced from the beginning of the Star League to the current, or to the end of the Star League. That's a huge amount of number. That would suggest that jump sh the drop ship count was in the millions. But when you look at the sheer amount of settled systems, there's roughly 200 settled, uh, acknowledged settled <laughs> systems in the inner sphere. And I find that kind of ironic that, mm. does, that if you add up all, what, all the house manuals claim the houses individually have, it's almost the same number that they have for jump ships. It's like it's suggesting one house or one planet, one settled planet, one jump ship. It just, right? Okay, in my mind. So it's far more likely that, that the suggested 2,000 reigning jump ships as of 3025 are grossly understated. So working with this number of a, quote, minute of the Star League production, roughly 230,000 divided by 60 is about 5,300 surviving ships. In my mind, given a given a, a generous loss and failure rate of twenty percent, we still should have around forty two hundred and forty jump ships, more than double what the lore suggests. And I find that much more palatable. I believe that each house probably has a couple thousand jump ships between the merchants and the mercs that they employ, and the house-controlled navies and, and stuff of their own. Having and each house, of course, based on its size, would have more or less in that balance. What lore fails to talk about it in, or what, what the lore failed to take into account isn't the amount of military movement, but the civilian movement needs of the Star League and the Great Houses. Over and over again, both lore and story implies that travel within the inner sphere is active. It would be reasonable to suggest millions, if even tens of millions, of, of citizens travel, be it for business pleasure or a need to relocate. This implies that the need for jump ship capacity has to be greater than what the lore allows for. It just simply doesn't support it. It doesn't support 
what the books and the and the, and the stories and, and conjecture or yeah, just just doesn't support it. And consider raw resources and manufactured goods, food, water, etc. The volume of commercial needs for space travel is a gross magnitude higher than the the 3025's quote 2000 allows for. The economy simply wouldn't work otherwise. It just doesn't work. The math does not work. Period. We look at our world today. Right now, there's a, there's a problem with shipping stuff from around the world, and, and there's hundreds of shipping uh, container ships parked off the coast of uh, America alone waiting to get unloaded, causing all kinds of delays and problems and, and concerns. And after watching a different video on that subject here a while back, I, it, they, they stipulate that roughly worldwide there's about 5,300 container ships. 5,300, and we're constantly building bigger ones. The biggest ones can hold as many as 20,000 containers, okay? And this is barely enough to, it, 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 it supports the world economy as we know it. So if you translate that into an interstellar mime, you know, take that to an interstellar meme, and look at it from that perspective. The, inter the, 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 the Federated Commonwealth with 400 plus settled worlds over a vast area space simply cannot use a few, you know, 700 ships to move it all. It isn't possible. There just isn't possible. Not, not ever. So, and then we add that to attrition. So we've got age, jump failures, breakdowns, even internal dis intentional destruction, i.e. combat taking its toll. Despite how well made the Star League era tech is, the 12 per year, 12 per year production wouldn't keep up with the losses. The inner sphere would be on a downward slide that would, esc would, would increase with every decade. FTL transport wise, they just si simply could not be sustained. You could not sustain the, the, the inner sphere as an entity at all, period. It's not going to happen. So to me, the the concept that, that we have this, this intentional ceiling is acceptable. I, I understand in my mind what I think the designers and creators had thought when that co subject come up. Because when you create a game system from scratch, when you're building something new, there's a lot of things that go into this. Plus, I, mean, I, I talk about this off and on in other videos. I spent better part of 10 years creating my own very extensive, elaborate game system. And uh, I know the sheer amount of work that went into these game systems to make them playable, sustainable, fun, and believable. Because in part... You need to be able to immerse yourself in whether you're playing a war top, tabletop game system uh, or you're playing a role-playing game system. You need to be able to immerse yourself in the story, in the elements. And while there's a lot of various ways to do that and various opinions, you know, there's countless opinions on how this immersion can work, uh, having the mechanics there, people are always going to ask more questions. So when you have beta testers come up and they say, well, how do my people get from here to there? So your designers have to come up, okay, well, here, here's how we're going to deal with this. We're not going to, you know, Star Trek has its warp, has, has its, its warp speed, and Star, Star Wars has its hyperspace, and other game systems have this, that, and the other thing. But, but So in Battletech, we have jump, jump drives, and we have, uh, we're going to instantaneously travel from point A to point B. And that works that same way in my own game system. The, 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 the counterbalance to that is that it takes days, if not weeks, to repower the jump drive. This is to prevent uh, a blatant abuse. So if we, if we look at this from, a, from an other angle, if there was only roughly 2,000 jump ships available to the inner sphere period as of 3025, then if... If the, and if the jump ships actually had this instantaneous constant ability to just keep jumping, if they didn't need to take a week to, to two weeks to recharge their, their batteries, if they could just have a one day turnover, I would be much more, I'd buy into that 2000 jump ship much easier because now the magnitude is each jump ship's capable of making 300, roughly 320 jumps in a given year based on the, uh, on the Terran year. So now, as opposed to only making uh, 25 jumps a year, if it takes you two weeks, 
and say we'll do an average because it's between a week and two weeks to recharge your jump ship. Your jump ships, that individual jump ship is only going to make about 25, 30, maybe 35 jumps in a given year. And that's assuming it's on the move constantly. And these ships would have to be to support the economy that's going on here. So the idea that a mercenary command would have a jump ship or two just sitting idle for a year? I mean, they go to a, they go to a, and they get a, they, they get a contract and, and, you know, let's look at uh, the Northwood Highlanders. Northwood Highlanders has, has five Battle Mac regiments with support. They're going to need a minimum of five jump ships available to them. A minimum, probably closer to seven or eight. And then to suggest that these, these ships are basically doing nothing when they're at their, when they're not out in conflict. So these, these, the Highlanders are garrisoning this planet and their jump ship is just kicking the teals back up at the, for, until they're ready to go on a mission. Because what else good would they be? I mean, in part, one of the values of a Merc unit having its own uh, FTL jump capacity is that flexibility. The employers are, are paying extra for that ability for that Merc unit to be deployed almost on demand someplace else. Because they have, and this goes for the same for the house military. How many house military commands, so some of their elite units, all it stipulates in the, in the canon that they have their own jump ship assigned to them. This means this jump ship's sole purpose is to sit there in preparation for that movement. Now, that's one thing. It means it's, they, they keep the mileage and wear and tear on the ship down. But that's taking the, those ships out of the economy. So we're back to that same problem where the, the average house is about 700 merchant ships. Well, they're going those house lords are going to be absolutely have to you know, to to uh, support this economic trade need by utilizing house warships. In this case, those and and even contracting these mercs who have merc jump ships to use those jump ships to move freight, not just their you know their military units. Not to mention logistics. It's 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 a given that all all military units need parts. They need weapons. They need ammunition. They need consumables. They need replacements, etc., etc. So that means a logistics chain in motion, in constant motion. So if a jump ship could jump into a system, kick loose its one to one to however many, you know, depending on how big the, the one, uh, one of the biggest ones can hold 20 jump ships or 20 drop ships. Uh, so if you could kick loose all your drop ships and then reattach new drop ships the next day and jump to the next system, and not sit around for a week to two weeks or you're waiting for our batteries to recharge or jump drives to recharge. Uh, that's a bit more palatable in my mind. All right. Anyway, I like. I really would like to hear you guys' opinion on this particular subject within jump uh, within BattleTech. And I know individually it doesn't matter to the gameplay. You're going. This is not one of those. This is one of those nuts and bolts things. You know, for those of us who really, really want to work within the rules of a game system and to utilize the the spirit and the flavor to its fullest effect, you know, there's so many uh, uh, cliffhangers, option opportunities revolving around that jump ship. You know, the jump ship's forced to flee uh, for its own safety and stranding the unit on the planet, so they have no choice but to keep doing what they're doing until the jump ship can come back and get them or that uh, you know our, our logistics situation is dire and we're waiting on something because blah right but anyway this is Rick and you guys have a great weekend till next time